Let me tell you my heart this year, a little different. You know, in the past that we had a sunrise service and then we'd have a breakfast and we'd have one Easter service. But I, I really just felt we may not do this again in the church's life, but I believe that there's a season right now that the fields are ripe. And Easter ought to be one of the most evangelistic times of the year. And so I felt like we needed to have two services and I needed to ask you to invite some people with you. I mean, you know, God didn't just call a pastor to be an evangelist. He called God's people to be evangelists. And what I am asking you to do is find some people. They'll come to Easter when they won't come to any other service. They will. And so I really felt in my heart this year, we're going to go to two services. We're going to try to fill up both of these services with as many lost people as we can so that they can hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. What better time than on an Easter service than them for them to come into God's house, hear the word of God. The Bible says that Jesus would draw all men unto him. And we need you to be an evangelist and get them here. We do have two sign-up sheets where we're going to ask you to sign up and bring 10 of your closest friends who are lost. I want you to find the most ranked sinner you can find. I want you to find that person that you thought they'll never get saved. And I want you to invite them and tell them you'll pick them up and you'll feed them breakfast. You say, well, I ain't going to take them to breakfast. Guess what? We're going to have breakfast here. Between the two services, we'll have breakfast that morning. So if you come to the early service, you can stay and eat breakfast. If you're coming to the late service, you can come and eat breakfast and then stay for our later service. We just want to reach people. We're all, I hope, going to heaven one day. And one thing I don't think we'll ever have to apologize for. We'll never have to say we're sorry to Jesus for trying to be more evangelistic. And so I felt like if we needed to change some services to reach more people, then God, I'm not going to apologize to you. I just want to see some souls saved. And so I hope that you'll make Easter a priority. I keep finding out one thing. Every time we offer an early service, we did it back during COVID. Everybody signed up for the early service we had. So far, people are signing up more for the 830 service. It just tells me that we may have church at 6 o'clock before it's all said and done. And you can come and, and have Jesus. And then I, a pastor friend of mine says, he tells his church, man, bring your trucks hooked up with your boat if you want to. So you can have church and, and go skiing, fishing, whatever you want to do. But I want you to f be fed the Word of God. It's the most important thing we can give you today. If you've got your Bibles, open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. About two weeks ago, I don't say this to over-spiritualize myself, but I really felt impressed by the Holy Spirit about this particular story and I'll tell you why from there the gospel of Mark chapter 6 is where Jesus had just fed the 5,000 and as we'll pick up in just a moment the Bible says he constrained the disciples to get into a boat what's unique about this particular story is you know we had the four gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John and three of the gospel writers all include this story in their narrative. I find that important because all of them saw the uniqueness of this story and they wanted to make sure that when the people read their letter, their account of Jesus Christ, that they heard this story. What spoke to me, I felt like, about this story was that when Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat, the Bible says that the boat was in the midst. It was in the middle. And this is what I really felt so led about the Holy Spirit, that Jesus told them to get into the boat and to launch out. And he told them that they were going to the other side, and I don't miss that point, but everything that happened to them happened in the middle of the lake. And you know, in life, that's where most people are right now. You have launched your boat of faith you've got saved and, and God has launched you out into life and we're not to the other side yet I don't know how long Jesus is going to tarry I don't know how long you're going to live but right now 
you are living life in the middle. And so much happens in the middle of your life. I'm not talking about a chronological time. I'm just talking about in the spiritual nature of your life. You launched, you're not to the other side, but you're in the middle. And sometimes the circumstances of the middle are not easy. We're going to see from this story that I believe that the circumstances that the disciples found themselves in the middle of this lake are metaphoric about life and what we as believers go through. And so this morning, as we look at the miracles in the middle, that we understand that while we're living this life in the middle, that there's a miracle that God can bring to your situation. I don't know if this message is for one person or for a for hundred people here today, but I, there's somebody, you're in the middle of something. And I want you to know I believe that God can bring a miracle while you're in the middle. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I just ask God that you would just help me today to impart your word. God, there's no doubt. <laughs> Lord, I can't add to or take away anything that your word has given us because, God, there's completeness in your word. God, my hope as a vessel, even as a shepherd, Lord, that I would do it the way you want it done. Holy Ghost, I pray that you would just give me the anointing, God, to speak to somebody today. Lord, I believe the most used messages you ever give pastors, God, are the ones, God, that cut through all the flesh, that cut through all the noise, and they go straight to the heart. Lord, my belief is today that this is a word that would, Lord, go straight to the heart. And Lord, somebody would leave here today not like they came in if the middle has been very tough. But God, they would leave here today knowing that and believing that there is a miracle in the middle for them. Lord, help me to do that. Lord, I thank you for these people that have come on this Sunday morning to hear your word. God, I thank you, God, for people who love you. I thank you today, God, for mamas and daddies who brought their children here today. Lord, we have no other hope except you. And Lord, we need more of you in this world than we've ever needed you before. And God, I believe that you're here and you're ready. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. The Bible says that beginning in verse 45 it says in straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before Bethsaida and while he sent away the people and when he had sent them away he departed into a mountain to pray and when evening was come the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he came unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it that it was a spirit, <clears throat> and they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of Good cheer, it is I, be not be afraid. And he went up unto them and to the ship, and when the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. You know, it's hard sometimes when you're going through difficult situations to believe that there's a miracle in the middle of your circumstance. Jesus came to the disciples. He had just performed a miracle where he fed the, the 5,000 plus the, the women and children, maybe 15,000 people. And immediately following that, he came and here's a boat on the shore and they're leaving the people. And Jesus told them, I need you to get into the boat and you're going to go to the other side. And all of a sudden in the the middle between launching out and getting to the other side, something happens in their life, something that they did not expect, something that they certainly were not looking for, something that they did not hope for, but nevertheless, it found them. 
And sometimes when you are in life, I want you to know that circumstances can find you. It doesn't mean that you are on the wrong path. It doesn't mean that you have not kept up with the law. It's just the idea that you're living in a fallen world. And I believe that in this story that there's some metaphoric circumstances that happen to the disciples that happen to men and women of God almost every day of life. First of all, it tells us beginning that they were in the middle. But the second circumstance comes in verse 48, and it says, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary. You see, I looked up the word contrary, and I believe with all of my heart that it's metaphoric that sometimes in your life there's just, you feel a pushback from somewhere. You can't and I can't see wind, but we can always know the effects of wind. And at this time, the disciples were in the boat, and the Bible says that they were rowing and they were toiling. The word toiling right there, the Greek word means that they were fatigued. What had fatigued them was this, this situation that they could not see, but they knew that it was there and it was wind. And many times in your life when you are living life in the middle, sometimes you, you may not know what it is, but you feel some type of force that you feel like is pulling against you. You don't always know the name of it. You don't always know where it's coming from. You just feel the resistance in your life. And right now the disciples are rowing, they're toiling, and in this moment the wind was contrary. It was going against them. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts used a scripture where he talked about his life and, and what he did. He, he says this, he says, Verily I thought with myself that I ought to do many things that were contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that contrary winds are metaphoric for an enemy that would like to steal, kill, and destroy your life. I believe that contrary winds are metaphoric that you may be going in the right direction, but there's still things that are trying to press you down and keep you from getting to where God wants to send you in your life. You know, a lot of times we think that those contrary winds, that there's no way that we can press on to the other side. And maybe you walked into this service feeling like there's some contrary winds to your life. But my hope is that through the power of the Holy Ghost that you know that there is a miracle in the middle that you're going to make it to the other side. And here it is, they're, they're rowing, they're toiling, and they're, they're trying to press on. And, and these winds are pressing up against them. Then the Bible tells us the, same, the next thing is, this same story is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14 and verse 22. And the Bible says that they were tossed with the waves. They were tossed with the waves. You see right here the, the tossed waves, I believe, that they are metaphoric as well. They, they represent a troubled sea. They represent that the circumstances are not good where they are. But yet God has allowed them to be in the middle of that situation. You see, they're metaphoric of a wicked society. We live in troubled waters right now. We live in a society of troubled waters, meaning that things are not right. They are unstable. They are not level. But even in unlevel playing conditions where there's an enemy that looks like he abounds, in unlevel situations where it looks like hope is gone, that is the place that sometimes God provides some of the greatest miracles in the middle of your situation. Let me read you this. You see, in Scripture, we find out about the wicked one. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, the Bible says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You know, right now, the trouble sees, they don't want to be tamed. I want you to understand that the world that is living in wickedness is not looking for the same hope that you came here to find in Jesus Christ. The waves are tossed right now. You say, well, 
Isn't it going to get better? I don't know if it's going to get better. I just know when it's going to get better. I don't know right now how bad it's going to get before it gets better. But I believe that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And right now the troubled waters may be rising up. And they may be metaphoric of a wicked one. But I came here to speak that the wicked one will not have the dominion over the saved one. The wicked one does not have power over the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't care how bad it is right now. The winds and the seas will obey at the name of Jesus Christ. So you are here today and you feel like you're in the middle and there's some contrary wind. There's some seas that are tossing and it looks like an unlevel playing field. And God begins to do miracles in those situations. The last thing we find metaphoric out of this story It talks about the darkness. John gives us this same story in chapter 6. And in verse 17, the Bible says, It was dark, and Jesus had not come to them. You know, darkness always represents a world that does not have the light of Jesus Christ. Darkness is metaphoric of a world that has rejected what Jesus has tried to bring them. And in this situation, the Bible tells us that it was dark. The shadow of death was hanging over them. They were in the middle of a sea. They were in the middle of a storm. The wind was blowing. The seas were tossed, and it was dark. Job felt the same way. In Job chapter 30 and verse 26, he said, But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for light, then came darkness. You see, I wonder how many people today have been through situations I'm talking about. I wonder why the Holy Ghost brought me to this passage over two weeks ago to remind some people that sometimes in the middle, it will not look good. Sometimes in the middle, the winds will be contrary. It will be dark. But I came by to give you some good news because in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 3, there was a time where the nation of Israel were going through some dark days where there were some uncertain times. And in a moment like that, this is what the word, the prophet of God said, I will give you the treasures of darkness. Now, when I read that, I thought treasures of darkness. How can there be treasures in darkness? And what I began to begin to see was that God was trying to remind the church that there are treasures in darkness. And what I want to give you from the word of God are some treasures in darkness. Because he says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden ridges of, uh, riches of secret places that you may know that I am the Lord who call you by your name and the God of Israel. He went down in verse 45 in verse 5. If we can go ahead and put it up. He said, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you up. I will lift you up. Though you have not, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light, and I create the darkness. I make peace, and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all of these things. What I can Came by to tell somebody it may be dark you where you're at right now, but don't you worry. God created the darkness. The devil did not create the darkness, and he knows how to bring you out of it. He is the God who created this world, and he is the God that can take care of you in the middle of your circumstance. You see, we give the devil all this credit like he created the darkness. God created darkness. And out of that darkness, he's about to create a miracle. So if I could give you something to leave here with tangible today, I want to give you some treasures that are found in darkness. And I believe this story gives you those treasures that that will be found in darkness. The next time that you have launched out in faith and you have not got to the other side and you're in the middle and you're rolling, you're tired. The winds are contrary. The sea is tossed about. It's an unlevel playing field. You know, we don't like that. We want all the rules to be followed. We want all the games to be correct. 
I want you to understand, we're on an earth where the devil is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. It's not a level playing field. What makes it all right for us is that we have the God that can make crooked paths straight. You see, I don't look for the world to, to try to judge me on a level playing field. I don't need my affirmation from the world. I have found my affirmation from Jesus Christ. I have found my affirmation from the one who gave me my life. I don't need them to tell me who I am. I know who I am in Jesus Christ. And here it is. The keys, the, the treasures in darkness. And if you want to write these down, I think they may help you in a different time of your life. You may not be in the middle right now. But you need to understand some point in your life, you're going to be in this same storm. You're going to be in this same moment. Here's the number one. It's found in Matthew chapter 14 and 23. The Bible says that when he went up to pray, you need to understand that when you are in the middle, Jesus is on the mountain praying. You see, it doesn't say that Jesus was down there with them in the moment. It says he went up to the mountain to pray. Jesus is always above any circumstance you're going to go through in your life. That's why in the book of Hebrews, you see, we're, we're not going through this without our high priest. The Bible says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. When, when the disciples were down there rowing, when they were down there tired, when they were down there fighting the wind, the high priest was on the mountain making intercession on our behalf. You see, the high priest was there. He knew what it felt like to be tired. He knew what it felt like to play against an unlevel field. But what do we know? That our great high priest, his name is Jesus Christ, and he has empathized with us. He knows that we are weak. He knows when we're tired. But praise God, he's on the mountain high above us taking care making intercession for your need you are not going through this battle in the middle you going through it with a high priest that's on the mountain who is calling your name out by the father and before you know it there's a miracle coming in the middle of your mess and he says but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are but he didn't see him that tells me there are times you've been through this and maybe you did get tempted. Maybe you did. Your faith failed. But Jesus is still on that mountain making intercession for you. And he says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The disciples were down in the boat. He would, they were down in the water. And Jesus was up on the mountain making intercession for us. I wish you could understand sometimes in our life when the Bible says it was dark and Jesus had not yet come to them, my first thought is, where's Jesus in the middle of this? Let me tell you where he's at. He's at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you. You're never going through this voyage of life without Jesus making intercession for you. And you need it. Because there's times it will be very difficult. Number two, the next treasure we find is in Mark chapter 6 and verse 48. The Bible says, he saw them. He saw them toiling and rowing. You know what it tells me about the treasure in darkness? There's times in my life that I can't see Jesus, but I'm glad that he can see me. They didn't know where Jesus was at. It was dark. It was windy. It was storming. And they're looking around and they're saying, where is Jesus right now? But Jesus could look down and he knew exactly where they are. I want you to hear me today, church. No matter what you're going through right now, Jesus knows exactly where you are. You may think, I can't see him. I don't feel him. I don't know where he's at. But I can tell you that the King of kings and the Lord of lords knows exactly where you are. He knows everything about your life. He knows everything about your circumstance. He knows everything about your problem. And praise God, he knows everything about how you can overcome it today. Aren't you glad that sometimes I may not see him, but I know today that he sees me. If he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground... 
He knows when you're going through your trouble. And maybe the Holy Ghost wanted to remind you today that you may not see him right now, but that he's looking down out of heaven and he's making sure that you're going to make it through whatever you're going through in your life. He saw them. And as he saw them, the Bible says, what did he do? He came to them. He came to them. There's no doubt that when it was contrary. The Bible says, he cometh unto them. Jesus prays for us. He sees us. And then he comes to us. I want you to hear me today. Whatever type of God the world wants to make of Jesus, where they put him so high up that he can't be touched, or they put him so outside that he, he can't be personal, that's not Jesus Christ. We serve a God whose name is Jesus Christ that comes to us when we're going through problems. I don't know about you that I, every service that I know that the Holy Ghost is here, that is the atmosphere that I hope God sets every time that we come together. Because if we just come in here and we sing some songs and we hear some preaching and we go home. No, I want Jesus to come to somebody today. I want Jesus to come to somebody who needs healing. I want them healed today. I want Jesus to come to somebody who needs delivering today. I want Jesus to come. You say, do you think it works like that? I know it works like that. I've read too many times in Scripture where Jesus came to them and something changed in their life. And today, I want you to know that Jesus came can come to you that no matter where you are right now, when he comes, he's bringing when the armies of heaven, he's bringing the power of the Holy Ghost, he's bringing the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He's coming with healing. He's coming with forgiveness. He's coming with redemption. Praise God, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. You just hold on and let him find you in the middle of the storm and get you to the other side. It says he's coming. And then it says he's coming walking on water. What was keeping the disciples in fear, Jesus came walking on top of. Isn't that awesome? No matter how bad your problem is, Jesus can come to you walking on top of your problem. You say, well, you don't know how bad it is. I just know Jesus is above it. I just know Jesus is bigger in it. I know Jesus can walk on top of it. And no matter what you're going through, Jesus has the power to walk on water and find you where you are. The Bible says he came to him walking on water. Now, I tell you this. Don't you wish you had that kind of faith? You know what's so crazy about that? Nothing in that word tells us that we can't walk on water. Just most people don't get out of the boat. I mean, really, think about it. We were talking about fishing before church. When's the last time you fishermen decided, let me try it like Peter? There's a catfish over there about 100 yards, and you said, let me step out of the boat and go get that thing. I guarantee you, no, Mug, you'd be scared of alligators. You see? He came walking on the water so many times in our life. We give so much power and ability to the circumstance. Jesus says, I'm going to walk on top of the circumstance and get to where you are. Is there anything that God cannot do? There's nothing. And so when we go through and we're living life in the middle, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And then what does he do? they scared to death, and he does what? He speaks to them. They're scared. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that he speaks to them. And what does he say? Be of good cheer. It is I. It is I. So here's Jesus. He was praying for them. He was looking down at them. Now he said he's going to them. Now he's walking on top of water. And now he says, I'm going to speak to him. And he says, it is I. Be of good cheer. It makes us remember Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. When Moses was questioning, what am I going to do when I go before Pharaoh? I, who, who do I have to go into the courtroom of Pharaoh? Who, sent, who is going to send me to do that? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Why do you think when what the words he said, he said, be of good cheer. It is I. 
They had not recognized him up until that point. But when he said, it is I, all of a sudden something began to change in their life. And then John tells us something really incredible. Jesus comes to them. He speaks to them. He gets in the boat. And then the Bible says, immediately, when Jesus got into the boat, they were at the other side. Think about that. They were struggling. That's the problem about life. We know that we've launched out. We know that we're on a journey with God. We know that God is taking us somewhere. But we know that there is an other side. The struggle of life is we just don't know how close we are to getting through this situation. We just don't know. about this church he told them when he got immediately to the other side in John chapter 6 and verse 21 it says when Jesus got into the ship immediately the ship was on the other side so many times we're in the middle and we're thinking how in the world can we get to the other side and all of a sudden Jesus gets in we allow him to take over our situation and all of a sudden before we know it we're already on the other side of our problem. You know today, church, I wonder how close you are to the other side. How close are you to the other side of this situation you're going through? And you know, amazingly enough, what keeps us from experiencing this type of faith? It's when we're not able to tame our fears. That is always the enemy to make to the other side of our situation. It is our ability to allow fear to come in and stop the faith that God wants to produce. I put these verses. Can I just tell you how many times that the disciples were so scared? In Mark chapter 6 and verse 50, the Bible says they were troubled. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 26, the Bible says they were troubled and they cried out. In John chapter 6 and verse 19, that Bible says they were afraid. Here's Jesus, the Messiah. And all of a sudden, all we could think about in the middle of the storm were, was the fear that was gripping them. I want to just tell you today. Please don't let your fear master you. Because all of us are going to have times that we have. I've heard people say things before like, you know, you're not supposed to have fear. And they go, well, I'm concerned about it. I don't care what you name it. There's times in your life that you are scared. You can call it concern. You can call it fear. You can name it whatever you want to name it in your life. But I want you to understand that when those things grip you, you are scared. And if you tell me that you were in the middle of that storm, in the middle of that boat, you can see why they were scared. But where did it come from? Every, every mic is trying to give us trouble today. Undoubtedly, somebody needs to hear this. Let's try another one, Pastor Chan. We're going to figure it out, okay? I got the time. Let's try this one. Can't see one, two. There we go. We're going to find one that works. I told you the devil fell right out of heaven into the sound system and the, right? Let me tell you today, church, it's not that fear will not come and try to attack us. It's where that fear comes from. And, and Mark tells us where all of this fear came from. 
Isn't it amazing that sometimes in the Bible that we don't understand that the Bible tells us clearly why they were scared. It tells us clearly why they were afraid. And in Mark chapter 6 and verse 52, the, the writer, Mark, wanted us to see. It says, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. The writer tells us the reason that they had so much fear is because they had just seen Jesus feed 15,000 people. They had just seen the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. But they let their heart get hardened. And when you let your heart get hardened, it is always going to go to fear before it goes to faith. It is always going to be troubled. It's always going to be afraid. It's always going to be scared. It's always going to cry out. Because when you don't have a soft heart for God, you will always revert back to fear. That's why when trouble comes, you better fall on your knees and find Jesus first. You better not look for anybody else to give you words. You better not look for any other self-help book. You better find a place where Jesus can get you through your situation. And in this moment, they were afraid. They were scared. They cried out because their heart had become hardened. They forgot about the sensitivity of Jesus. Today, church, it is more important when you go through things in the middle of the storm of your life that you make it your plan that you get to wherever you can get in your spiritual life where you can be fed by Jesus. You know today, the Bible says they considered not the miracle of the loaves and fishes. I'll begin to go through and study how many miracles that Jesus performed in the middle. Did you know that there is a ton in this Bible of miracles that God did while things were in the middle. The greatest miracle that he did, I believe, is found in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. This is not a common miracle that a lot of people see in their life, but this is what it says, for he is our peace. What do you need when you go through that battle of your life? You need the peace of God. And the Bible says he has broken down the middle wall of petition between us. Why is this the greatest miracle of all? Because it tells me that when you go through some dire situations in your life, you see, before Jesus came, there was always a middle wall. It kept the people away from the holy of holies to the presence of God. And what this verse tells us, that we have peace now because the middle wall has been broken down. When Jesus was hanging on Calvary and the Bible says that the, the veil that was separated man and the presence of God, all of a sudden that veil that was in the middle wall was torn down. It was torn from the top to the bottom. And all of a sudden when that veil was torn down, all of a sudden man could have peace in their life again. I'm talking about a peace that did not come from the world and a peace that the world cannot give you. I'm talking about the creator of peace. His name is Jesus Christ. He gives us peace. He created peace. And right now when you are in the middle, God has broken down the veil to get you peace to get you through where you are. Now think about this. You say, well, how close am I, am I, am I to the other side? All I can tell you is that God's peace will help you to get there. Whether it's today, tomorrow, or two years from now, the peace of God what about another story we found in the book of Daniel? This is a very familiar story that we have. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and he rose up in haste and he spake and he said to his counselors, did we cast three men bound? Where was it at? In the midst of the fire. What does that tell us? In the middle of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar's looking on the outside. He's saying I'm looking into the middle of the fire. We put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the middle of the fire and 
they answered and they said unto him, True, O king. And then it says, He answered, He said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt upon them, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What I came by to tell you, you may be in the middle of your situation, but I came by to tell you Jesus is right there in the middle with you, and he's going to get you out to the other side. All you got to do is trust and believe, and you're going to make it to the other side of your situation. He is in the middle of your situation. The last one I want to give you today. All of a sudden, the Bible tells us where Moses was on the backside of a desert. He was in the middle of nowhere. He was in the middle of the desert. And the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus chapter 3, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the middle of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Hear me today, church. You may feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. You may feel like you're in the middle of the greatest circumstance you've ever had to face in your life. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that the bush began to burn. And as it burned, he thought, can you imagine? He's thinking, well, at some point, this thing's got to burn up. But it didn't. God began to speak to him in the, out of the middle of that bush to tell him that God's still got business to do in his life. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If you were here for the first time, we just want to get to know you a little bit more and give you some information about our church and how to get connected. All you have to do is click the link above in the description, fill out the information, and we will reach out to you soon. Once again, we are so glad that you joined us online today. And as always, we love you, we're praying for you, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.